Question 45 deals with the question of what happens when you overfit a regression model. So let's say that you have a model where a certain uh, dependent variable y depends actually on two independent variables x1 and x2. So the true model is y is equal to beta naught plus beta 1 x2, x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus errors. Alright, now let's suppose that we overfit this model by thinking that another uh, variable, say x3, is also relevant to the regression. And so we run y equal to beta naught plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3 x3 plus u. This is known as over specification because you are, specif uh, you are uh, regressing using a model that is over specified in the sense that it includes an unnecessary variable. Alright, so the thing is that beta 3 is actually 0 in the true model, whereas you are using uh, a model where beta 3 is also being estimated. Now, the thing here is that the catch really comes from the fact of whether x3 is completely uncorrelated to x1 and x2 or whether it might be even slightly correlated with at least one, even one of them. The, the catch is that well, irrespective of whether there is correlation or not, the thing is, the moment you run this model, as you might expect, beta 3 is, I mean, x, x3 should not have any impact on y, right? So, even when you run the model, you will still get beta 3 equal to 0, and none of the other coefficients will be biased. However, in the case that x3 is even mildly correlated with either x1 or x2, your standard deviation, your standard errors on measuring the coefficients beta, beta naught, beta 1 and beta 2 will all go up as in, uh, which is to say that your estimate, your OLS estimate using this particular uh, model of estimation might not any longer be the best model in the sense that it might not have the minimum variance. The moment, and this will kick in the, mo the moment there is some correlation between x3 and either x1 or x2. If there is no correlation, you will continue to have minimum variance even if you include x3. But then it's very unlikely that you would include an irrelevant variable when it has nothing to do with the model. And zero correlation is a very highly unlikely scenario in any case. So in general, if you include unnecessary variables, the coefficients will not be biased but will in general have larger standard deviations. All right. Question 46 is as simple and straightforward as it gets. You have a mod, you have two regression models, one where you are regressing y on one single uh, independent variable and y, one where you are regressing it on two independent variables. The question asks, what are the variances of the coefficient of x1 which is an independent variable in both models? What is the variance, I mean how do the variances of alpha 1 as it had, as it is f1, as it is estimated, comparing the two models. Well, but the question is, what is the true model? If this is the correct model, it will have the lower variance. If this is the correct model, then this will have the lower variance. The fact is, you see, I mean, the fact is, if model A is the correct model, then model B is over specified and will have alpha 1 from model B will have a larger variance. Now, if model B is the correct model, then model A is under specified and well in that case not notably is alpha 1 in model A bias will also have larger variances than the alpha 1 from model B. So the thing is you simply cannot be certain of which of these alphas, alpha 1s will have the larger variance. It could be either larger for the first one or larger for the second one and you simply cannot say. So the answer here is that you simply cannot say which one is greater or smaller and that would be option 3. Alright, so let's move on to question 47. Question 47 is about hypothesis testing and type 1 errors. A type 1 error is what happens in hypothesis testing when you have another hypothesis that you reject but it turns out that in actuality the hypothesis was actually true. Now, uh, when you reject, when you have a T statistic that you uh, well, and you reject the null if the absolute value of the t statistic 
it's greater than 1.96. It's, uh, it's well known that this has a 5% chance of running into a type 1 error. That is, if you test the null hypothesis that b1 equal to 0 for example, and you reject the null, there's a 5% chance that your null was actually true, that b1 is in fact actually equal to 0. Now, uh, so you have two different test statistics. One which tests whether b1 equal to 0, and one which tests whether b2 equal to 0 in this particular case. Now, uh, the question asks, what is the probability that if you use these two test statistics and say that uh, if you use this test that you reject the null hypothesis that b1 equal to b2 equal to 0 that they are both you reject the null hypothesis that they are both simultaneously 0 if either t1 or t2 exceeds 1.96 an absolute value what does this mean? this means that well uh, the thing is how can a type 1 error arise in this case? In this particular case, for a type 1 error to emerge, that would mean that actually b1 equal to b2 equal to 0, which would mean that separately b1 is 0 and b2 is 0. Now, if b1 is 0, then your t1 should be greater in absolute value than 1.96. But this would not be the case in 5% of the cases, because that's the chance of type 1 error in the hypothesis test on b1. Similarly, the hypothesis test on B2 could be wrong in 5% of cases. Now, the question is, what is the probability that at least one of these two tests is wrong? That's the, pro the probability that there's a type 1 error in the joint t-test uh, of B1 equal to B2 equal to 0, where you're using the test that is either T1 or T2 greater than 1.96 an absolute value, then the probability of the type 1 error in the joint test is the probability that at least one of these tests is zero uh, is wrong? There's a type one error in at least one of these tests. So, which is the probability there's a type one error in type one in the first test plus the probability that there's a type one error in the second test minus the probability that there's a type one error in both tests. Now, because that's included twice, right? Once here and once there. So you need to subtract that out. Now, the, since you now the question says these two tests, these two statistics are independent of each other, which means that the probability that there's a type 1 error in both of them is simply the product of the probabilities that there's a type 1 error in either of them. So you get a 5% chance here plus a 5% chance here minus 5% times 5% here. So that will give you a total of 9.75%, which is greater than 5%.